Next, it's a story of ambition, mutiny, heroism and survival. A voyage that swiftly descended into a nightmare at sea, a gruelling test of endurance that lasted 13 months, pushing the crew of the Belgica whaling ship to the depths of despair and even madness. But the 1897 Belgian Antarctic expedition would also serve as an example for subsequent missions to the South Pole, including one undertaken by our next guest, Julian Sancton, is a writer, journalist and author of Madhouse at the End of the Earth. He's here in studio now with us for Perspective. Thanks so much for coming in to us here on the programme this morning, Julian. Thanks for having me. So firstly, it seems that everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong for the men on this voyage back in the 19th century. A comedy of errors. You've called it yourself. Even the cat, the ship's cat died, I believe, of depression. B so. Both of them. Uh, <laughs> one, one was thrown overboard very early on. Um, what initially uh, drew you to the story? It, it was... Uh, the first time I've heard of this uh, expedition was... Uh, while reading about NASA's plans for manned missions to Mars, and uh, there are very few precedents to study this kind of long-term deep space exploration, the closest earthly analog were the expeditions of the heroic age of uh, Antarctic expedition of the turn of the 20th century. This is a very similar uh, crew size, a very similar uh, sense of of uh, entering into a hostile environment with very little uh, ability to communicate with the people back in civilization. So uh, NASA's, uh, NASA's anthropologists, actually, and, and uh, um, scientists have studied what went wrong and what went right in Antarctic expeditions for lessons to draw. And so the, the, when I read about one such mission that... Uh, I'd never heard of. We've all heard of Shackleton, we've all heard of Scott, we've all heard of Amundsen, but very few people have heard of the Belgica expedition. And I heard in those, those three paragraphs that I read, uh, stories of, as you mentioned, uh, a ship being stuck in the ice, people going mad, and it just felt like such gothic horror. It felt like something written by Edgar Allan Poe, or uh, I just felt I had to know more. And uh, I, I, five years later, came out with a book about it. Um, and uh, after deep archival uh, research and after having visited the Antarctic myself, although in more luxurious circumstances than the men I write about. And if, Julian, Belgium, it isn't the first country that we might think of when we exactly. think of maritime uh, adventures and expeditions of this kind. And mm -hmm. the crew itself, they were very young men, weren't they? And they seemed to be very unprepared for what they They had. certainly were. And Belgium, as you say, did not have the uh, most stellar maritime reputation. Uh, the... This was entirely driven by the dreams of the commander, Adrien de Gerlache, who was a, uh, a nobleman, a son of, uh, of uh, military men. And it was a very strange ambition for a, a Belgian to have, uh, to, to, to explore the seas. And, uh, but it was a time where the geographic societies of the earth decided that there was one area of the world map that was still unknown that, and that needed to be explored with the utmost urgency, and that was the Antarctic. And uh, Monsieur de Jarlache figured, well, why not me and why not Belgium? And there were good reasons why not, because there, were not very, uh, there, there wasn't a very uh, large contingent of capable Belgian sailors, and so he had to search elsewhere for people with polar experience, and so half of the sailors were Scandinavian. Um, which led to strife within the ship from the very get-go, uh, and also uh, a lot of scrutiny from Belgians who were thinking, "Well, this is supposed to be a Belgian expedition. How come there's it, it's there's so uh, so many non-Belgians on board?" The doctor um, on board was an American named Frederick Cook, who turned out to be a, a great one of his very few uh, great staffing decisions, and uh, the scientists, because this was a. a, a, a um, Above, above all, a scientific expedition. The scientists were Eastern European. That set a precedent for one of the first international uh, scientific expeditions of its kind, which uh, I think set the stage for what we see today with the International Space Station, for example, or uh, the successful cooperation in Antarctica. I think that really, uh, that was all to the credit of Adrien de Gerlache. Of course, having uh, such a young, inexperienced crew led to disaster in, in another area. So. Uh, and, and to a mutiny, as you suggested in your, in your intro. You mentioned the American that was on board, mm -hmm. Frederick Cook. Mm -hmm. now, he went on 
to, he's, he's known for less noble deeds. He did save the lives of those on board. They were eating a diet of penguins. Not all of them. Not all of them. <laughs> but talk to us a little bit more about him because he later lied about reaching the North Pole and was yes. imprisoned. Very mm -hmm. colourful character and controversial as well. Yes, he's known, uh, if he's remembered today, if he's remembered at all, as one of the great frauds in, uh, in a country with a history of, of great fraudsters. Uh, he was... I think a cross between, you know, P.T. Barnum and uh, Harry Houdini. You know, it, it, he he shared a stage with with both of them, as it happens. So uh, he is known, as you say, in 1909, he made headlines around the world for having reached the North Pole, and he had previously made headlines around the world for having reached the uh, tallest peak in North America, Mount Denali, then known as Mount McKinley. And it turns out that both of, this, both of those achievements were almost certainly fabrications. And he would later, uh, you know, go down as, as a huckster. And, and uh, when he had nobody else to finance his expeditions because of this, this reputation that he'd developed, he turned to oil speculation. He wanted to remake himself as, one of, as an oil man at the, and take advantage of the great oil boom. And, and uh, instead... Uh, got involved in a Ponzi scheme of, of, of enormous proportion and was jailed in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary for uh, seven years. And so he was, th this is why I found it so poignant that he turned out, this great anti-hero turned out to be the hero of the Belgica expedition. I found that contrast to be, uh, to be remarkable. And so he's, he's the hero uh, or, or one of several heroes of, of my book. And it turns out that this capacity that he had to lie, to twist the truth, to distort, in the specific circumstance of the Belgic, it turned out to be a life-saving instinct of his because he, it, it, was, it showed great imagination in a circumstance with no sun, no light, uh, freezing cold, no, uh, uh, no depleting uh, uh, provisions. He was able to come up with uh, truly ingenious solutions that are still, uh, uh, that still have uh, repercussions today and, and there still have lessons to, to give today. And Julian, as you say, it was the first scientific expedition mm -hmm. to the Antarctic. You also say that it had a romantic endeavour at its core. You yourself followed in their footsteps, yes. if we can use that term. Did you get a sense of that? Like, what did, what did that bring to you, having been to the Antarctic yourself? I, when I set out to write this, I wondered whether it would be possible to write about it just, just by using the diaries and, re and relying on the accounts that had... Uh, been written by the survivors of this expedition, and uh, surely, sure enough, as you say, they were they were driven themselves by a romantic instinct, um, by you know uh, filling a gap in world maps that had up till then only been filled by imaginative authors and and uh, literature uh, like Jules Verne, for example, had written about this. But uh, so they themselves wrote very beautifully about the uh, the the Antarctic. And yet, I figured there would be something missing if I didn't go myself, if I wasn't able to capture the sights and sounds and even smells of the Antarctic. Uh, so I went in the, uh, in the Antarctic summer, which corresponds to our winter, and uh, in which the temperatures were uh, a, a lot more agreeable than some of the ones the, uh, that, that uh, the, the men I write about had to endure. And, I, and it, it just so happened that I went to the very area that was discovered by Adrien de Gerlache. It's now known as the Gerlache Strait. And it is the most mind-blowingly beautiful, spectacular stretch of the, of, uh, the Antarctic continent um, and one of the most beautiful places on Earth. It, it just seems like the mountains soar on each side with the snow line stopping at the water. So it, just, it seems like something out of out of Tolkien or uh, the cover of a Yes album or something. It just, it's it pure, it's phantasmagorical um, and uh, awesome in its majesty. Of course, I did not, uh, you know, I, the, I did not experience the entrapment in the ice that the men I, uh, I write about experience. Method writing has its limits. Uh, so I, I figured I could, I, that I could rely on the diaries for, but I still got a sense of, for example, you know, we imagine the Antarctic Antarctic to be a purely black and white environment, just snow and water. In fact, it is, it is uh, uh, in incredibly colorful and, and polychromatic. You see that from the, the lichen to the, the penguins to the deep blues of the, of the water and the, the, the 
caverns that are, are dug in, in the icebergs. It's a really majestic place. It's a fascinating account, yeah. Julia. I'm very sorry. We will have to cut across you because that's unfortunately <laughs> all we have time for. Just to mention as well, you're on your way to San Malo for yes. a literary festival as well. That is Julian Sancton, author of Madhouse at the End of the Earth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. With us. Thank you, Julian.